mode. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to week two of the Building Energy Efficiency Short Course. Um, I'm Karen, and I'm going to be presenting with Aaron Lennox today about existing buildings and retrofits. Um, so just a reminder, your course instructors are myself, um, Rob Best, and we have Erin Lennox joining us today. So I'm just going to give her, let her uh, give a quick introduction about her background in buildings. Hi guys, as Karen mentioned, I'm Erin. I've been the project director for ESW for, I believe, three years now. Um, that screaming in the background is that chubby baby you see there, although he's now a two-year-old. Um, I, I actually went for a PhD in ecological economics, but before that I got a degree in mechanical engineering and spent a couple years working in HVAC design and energy modeling, so I'm going to be sharing some of that experience with you guys today. All right. Um, so just a quick review of the course content. Um, last week we had a quick review of um, building energy efficiency and why it matters. This week we're going to be focusing on existing buildings and retrofits. Um, and then in future weeks we're going to be talking more about energy modeling and whole building design, as well as um, alternative building approaches and special topics to be determined, I believe, next week. All right, so I'm going to talk about single family homes and multifamily homes and the best approaches for um, retrofitting both of these types of housing. So for single family homes, the biggest opportunities to improve the energy efficiency are in the envelope or the thermal boundary, so where the house meets the outside. Um, and the first step in doing this is to identify the problem areas of the house. So when you're first going to a single family home, there are a couple of diagnostic tools you can use, and I brought a couple of pictures from my experience in the field. Um, so the first one is using an infrared camera, and you can see a couple of those images on the left. So when, it, when you're using an IR camera, you're looking for a temperature difference, which, is represent, which represents the heat flow through a building's flaws. Um, so if there is a gap between uh, baseboards and the outside, if there's not enough insulation, you can usually see that through the camera. If there's enough of a temperature difference between inside and outside, so if it's a cold day. Um, you can also kind of see fingers of cold air. Um, this is useful when you're looking at things like windows. Windows will always have a pretty big temperature difference, so you're looking kind of around them to see if air is flowing into the building. Um, so the pictures you can see on the left, on the top one is a baseboard at the bottom of a room that hasn't been propped and sealed at all. So you can see the fingers of cold air coming in. And on the top, you can see um, a ceiling on the top floor of a building that has an uninsulated roof. So you can see that um, the hot air is kind of rising up to the cold blue area. Um, so you can kind of see the heat loss. And this is a great way to show building owners or homeowners um, how heat is moving through their building. Um, another diagnostic tool that we use a lot in single family homes is the blower door, which you can see the setup on the right. Um, so to explain this, a uh, blower door is kind of like inflating a leaky beach ball. So if your beach ball doesn't have any holes in it, you can just blow it up no problem. It doesn't take a lot of pressure. Um, if you have small holes in your ball, you can blow into it and eventually it will fill up, but you need to keep providing a stream of air to keep it fully inflated. And the more holes there are, the more air you have to blow to keep the ball inflated. So this blower door is essentially a cover on the door with a hole for a large fan. Um, so it depressurizes the house by blowing air out of it, and that creates a slight vacuum indoors. So we usually try to uh, depressurize the home to negative 50 pascals, and then figure out what volume of air is moving through the house during that depressurization. So qualitatively, you, once you have the home depressurized, you can walk around and feel air moving in through the leaks. Like if you hold your hand up near an electrical cover or by a window that isn't very well sealed, you can feel that. Quantitatively, you're measuring the air volume out, of, out through the fan at a specific depressurization. 
um, in cubic feet per minute. And you can use that to represent it in the number of air changes per hour or the amount of new air, like how many times your home is completely filled with a new amount of air. And also quantitative, but a little more hand wavy, you can translate this to an approximate leakage area. So you can say, if you are blowing out 2,000 cubic feet per minute um, of air, that corresponds to this square footage of holes that are in your home. So that's a good way to represent it to building owners. They'll be like, oh, that's as big as a window or something like that. We should seal that up and um, address those leaks. So how do you address those leaks? By air sealing and insulation. And I have a couple of kind of dim looking photos, also from my um, experience on the job, of air sealing and insulation. So as I have talked about in, when we were talking about the diagnostics, Air leakage is caused by a hole between zones, between the inside and the outside, and a pressure to push air through that hole. So those holes can be windows, doors, seams between the wall and the floor, or in recessed lights, um, or intermediate zones like attics, basements, crawl spaces. And the pressure occurs from stack effect, which is a byproduct of uh, convection of air inside the building. So hot air rises because it's less dense, and that causes cooler outdoor air to infiltrate into the building from the bottom to replace it. So there's air being drawn in at the bottom, and that pushes air, hotter air up at the top during the winter. So when you're air sealing and insulating, you have to focus on bigger leaks as well as leaks at points of highest pressure. So that means looking for big opportunities for sealing as well as um, opportunities at the top and the bottom of the house. Um, so the examples I have in the pictures over here are from um, an attic in a small multifamily for three units. So um, the left is air sealing before the insulation. Um, basically wherever there's a penetration between the top floor and the roof cavity, you seal that up with foam. So that's where plumbing comes into the attic, if there's um, a gap between the wall and the rafters, things like that. And then once everything is sealed, you cover it with insulation. Um, so you can see that on the right. And the material used there is what's called blown-in cellulose insulation. It's basically newspaper that is fireproof, and it's in tiny pieces. Um, so insulation reduces radiation and convection within cavities, like the walls of the attic, um, and it forces the heat to conduct instead through a fiber or a foam, and those are poor conductors. So generally, an insulation material has millions of tiny air pockets to slow heat transmission. So cellulose is one example, but there's also fiberglass or expandable polystyrene, which you might know as styrofoam. And these insulation materials are measured in R value, which is um, a measure of thermal resistance. So one important thing to note about insulation is that it must be continuous to ensure maximum R value. So if there is, um, basically you're trying to slow down the path of the heat moving up. And if there is a gap in the insulation, all of the air is going to be able to flow through that gap and effectively bring the R value down to zero. So you need an even spread of the insulation throughout the building, or throughout the attic, or throughout the wall, or wherever it is that you're insulating. Um, and then one last note about air sealing is that um, your house does need some air flowing through it from the outside as a healthy homes measure. If you have a lot of, if you don't have fresh air, you're going to have mold problems and um, smoke problems and just generally combustion by byproduct. Anything that is in your building, that's made in your building, is going to stay there and cause some problems. So if you air seal too much, um, that's going to cause problems. And the best way to address this is rather than just not air sealing, you should add mechanical ventilation. So this is basically just a fan that blows indoor air out and replaces it with fresh outdoor air as needed. Um, and this is something that the diagnostic tools, the blower door, they will help inform how much ventilation you need. So that is 
Um, the main thing I want to talk about for single family homes, and I just want to take a quick break at this point to see if anyone has any questions about air sealing and insulation. You do, feel free to raise your hand. You can unmute you. All right. Um, so next, I want to talk about multifamily housing, which is kind of my area of expertise. Um, as I talked about last week, I work within the city of Chicago with um, low-income multifamily housing. Um, I work with building owners to do the energy assessments of their properties, but also help them figure out how to finance, um, finance the uh, improvements that they are interested in how to figure out what's best for their property, how just all sorts of things. Um, so multifamily housing is a bit different from single family housing, especially in the energy assessment process and what motivates people to move forward with energy efficiency measures. So in single family housing, the use of diagnostic tools like the IR camera and especially the blower door is a lot easier than in multifamily. Uh, multifamily housing, you have a bunch of different tenants, a bunch of different doors, and just a larger building in general. So it's a lot harder to depressurize the building or get everyone to agree to um, use the equipment in their homes. Um, there's also what's called a split incentive. Um, if the tenant is paying for their own gas or oil or electricity, the owner, who is the decision maker in the process, might not feel the need to invest in energy since they will not see uh, dollar savings themselves. But on the flip side, if the building is centrally heated, if it has one big boiler that goes to radiators in each unit, then there's uh, much higher opportunities for savings um, and much more interesting things that you can do to um, improve the efficiency in the building. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was improving the heating system. And the one really obvious way you can do this is by replacing your heating system with a high efficiency model. Um, so far as to furnaces, to boilers, to heat pumps, and all these things. So most of these are gas powered systems. And the way gas heating appliances work is that they combust, and some energy is inevitably lost to combustion. Um, and these, so that's money that's basically right up the chimney. So if you can get a higher efficiency of, of your system, that means less money is wasted on not feeding the home. So there are many ways to heat a space. You can heat air or water, convert water to steam, and then move those fluids through the building, through forced air, through radiators, through whatever um, your landlord has installed. So one example I wanted to talk about for high efficiency is a condensing boiler. Um, so this is a hot water boiler. It's basically taking water from the city, heating it up to, um, to below boiling, maybe 140 degrees, and um, from there, it circulates through the building in a closed loop system through radiators um, around the baseboards or through radiant ceilings, which is just a series of small tubes with hot water running through them. And so that's your standard efficiency system. Um, a condensing boiler recovers heat of vaporization. So basically, it takes the waste heat from the flue gas from combustion and preheats the water that's coming back from the system and is entering the boiler. So this causes the water vapor in the flue gas to be condensed and drained. And by doing so, you recover the latent heat of vaporization from those flue gases. And so you can see um, on the right here, the boiler in the temperature graph. Um, Basically, once you get into the condensing range of uh, the flue gas at 130 degrees Fahrenheit, your energy efficiency shoots up for a lower boiler in the temperature. So 
you can get from an 87% efficiency, which is about the maximum without the condensing technology, up to 96% or more, um, depending on how much money you're willing to pay, basically. And this technology um, can improve, can save a ton of money, but it's often very expensive. It's a high upfront capital cost. Um, so if that's too expensive, and it often is, what you focus on instead of improving the combustion efficiency is maximizing heat delivery to the units, improving the system efficiency. Um, and just a quick note here, I'm talking a lot about heating because that's been my primary experience with energy retrofits. Living in Chicago, it doesn't get very warm, and not a lot of the places that I've done energy systems on have central cooling. Sometimes tenants will bring their own uh, small window AC units, but that's about it. So heating is our primary focus because it's the greatest opportunity for savings. Um, so back to um, improving the system efficiency, I wanted to talk about pipe insulation and duct insulation. Um, so most of the heat generated from a boiler or from a furnace is sent to the place that it needs to be heated, the rooms. Um, and to ensure that it's not lost into the basement or the attic, you add insulation to whatever pipe or duct is carrying that heat to the rooms. So basically the thicker insulation you have, the less heat loss you have. And this is measured by the same R value that we talked about for attic insulation. And you can see that on the left. So as a caveat, um, a lot of pipe insulation is not a new technology. It's been around for a while. And a lot of the older stuff has asbestos, which is pictured in the middle. Um, asbestos is an extremely effective um, pipe insulator. It has a really high R value per inch, especially compared to fiberglass, which is currently used. But it's also a health hazard. It um, is very dangerous to your to lungs and can cause a lot of long-term health problems. Um, so a lot of so at this point we recommend switching out asbestos to the fiberglass, the directed fiberglass you see on the right. Um, a lot of people will just kind of tear off the asbestos on their pipe insulation, but that is a huge problem because um, that will release the asbestos fibers into the air. So this is something that requires a lot of professional support. Um, one other thing I want to talk about, and this applies both to single family and to multifamily, is heating, heating and cooling controls. Um, so one that you might be familiar with is programmable thermostats, which are most useful for furnaces or for electric heaters. Basically, you are setting what temperature your space is based on the day of the week and the time of day. So you can lower the temperature if it's winter and you're at work and you're not at home, and then have it automatically adjust to a higher temperature that you're comfortable with for when you're hanging out in the evening. So older models of programmable thermostats work. you basically set it for nights and weekends and you had specific things. But newer models like the Nest can be adjusted remotely via Wi-Fi. They take outdoor temperature into account and um, and they are also learning thermostats, so they can observe your habits and go from there. Um, got a question about what is a taco? Oh, that's, um, I'll talk about that in a sec. So the next one I want to talk about in the middle is outdoor reset control, which is used in hot water boilers, like uh, the condensing boilers we talked about earlier. Basically, um, with a lot of hot water boilers, you can set the temperature of the water that's circulating through the building. Um, and at higher outdoor temperatures, you want the water temperature circulated through the radiators to be a little cooler so that it's not overheating the building. So um, the outdoor reset control, which um, the taco control is an example of that. That's just a brand name. Um, it basically sets a curve. Uh, with just a thermostat, the water temperature would be set at something, some specific water temperature, like 200 degrees Fahrenheit. But with a taco control, there would be a sensor outside that 
says, oh, it's 40 degrees outside. I don't need to heat it all the way up to 200 degrees. The water can just be 120 degrees. So it sends a signal to the boiler um, and prevents a lot of wasted energy. And it also keeps the building a little more comfortable. It's not overheated. Tenants don't have two windows. Um, and then the third type of control is averaging controls. And these are used for both hot water and steam boilers. Um, so steam boilers work very similarly to hot water, except for they are circulating steam through the building instead of water. And basically throughout the, throughout the multifamily building, um, you place sensors that record temperature in different units. So uh, you want some on the top floor and the bottom floor, um, just all over. And you usually want about four to six sensors for a building that's maybe less than 50 units. So sensors throughout the building record the temperature. And then um, a central controller, which you can see on the right there, averages those sensors. Um, and if that average is below a set temperature, the boiler will turn on. And then um, when the sensor average reaches that desired temperature, it turns off again. So the control can remove specific data points from an average. So if one of the sensors is recording something that's much colder than the rest of them, that might be an indication that a tenant has opened a window because their room is overheated, and it wouldn't take that into account. So this makes sure that, that the building is not overheated and that it's more evenly heated overall. Although you, um, it requires other measures to properly balance the steam, steam system to make sure the steam is going to different radiators at exactly the same time and things like that. Um, steam systems are really complicated, they're really interesting, and if you have any questions, I would love to talk about them later. Or now, feel free to raise your hand if you have something specific you want to ask. Oh, for, now I said four or six sensors. Um, and it would definitely change with the size of the multifamily home. Um, it kind of maxes out at six. You kind of want to get the corners of the building plus um, a couple in the middle. But the more you have, the more expensive the system is, and the return on your investment gets a little lower. Um, any other questions? All right. Um, so then one more thing I wanted to talk about with um, There's another question. So the question was, what differentiates a more complicated control system from a user program thermostat? Is it just a pattern recognition that basically programs it for you? Um, yeah, that's part of it. Um, I believe it also takes outdoor temperature into account, kind of like the outdoor reset control. Yeah, it, and you can also run it from your phone. So if you are at work and you're like, oh shoot, I forgot to lower the temperature, you can do it remotely. All right, um, so then the last thing I want to talk about with regard to multifamily housing, um, although this applies in general, is the verification of energy savings. So I have here an example from my work of um, a building that received upgrades and how that affected the building. So a building owner that's looking at their gas and electricity bills might see a difference, um, but that's not necessarily the best metric. What if it's an especially warm winter and that's why the bills are cheaper? So the way that you, the way that you handle this is through um, an energy use intensity or EUI calculation. So EUI is basically weather normalized energy use divided by the square footage of the building. Um, so by weather normalized, we look at the total number of heating degrees or cooling degree days in a given year. And those are basically, um, it's a little complicated, but it's basically saying, is, is this, has this year been colder than average or warmer than average? Um, and we use that to normalize how much gas or electricity was used in a year. 
So what this allows you to do is you can compare buildings with different square footages from different years to each other. And you can also compare a building before and after it's received retrofits. Um, so on the right, um, on the screen here, you can look at what this building did. So one thing it did was air sealing insulation in the roof cavity, which um, I showed an example of before. It also received a boiler replacement, so it went to um, a high efficiency model. Model. I believe this was a steam boiler, so they weren't able to use the condensing technology, but they were able to get a new one. Um, their old boiler was likely original to the building, which was likely built in the 1910s and the 1920s. So their combustion efficiency had been slowly going down over time, and it wasn't heating the building very effectively. And then it also received insulation on the DHW, which is their domestic hot water. Um, or the water that's coming out of your taps. And they finally got um, pipe insulation on their heating pipes. So this um, on the left on the graph that is their pre-upgrade EUI. So for steam buildings, this can be, that's, that's a pretty high one, but that's, um, so you go from that, and then they were able to cut their energy in probably about 40% after they completed all those upgrades, which is really exciting. Um, and there's other uh, benefits to energy savings called non-energy benefits, so that includes um, increased comfort from the tenants, maybe uh, decreased maintenance costs since they no longer have super old equipment in the building. Um, there are all sorts of benefits there. Um, you can see we included a comparison to the average steam building, and this building is still um, still a little higher than what the average was for steam buildings in Chicago. Maybe this is because they don't, still don't have great controls over their boiler. Maybe they didn't do a lot of steam balancing. Um, so. That kind of shows that there's still an opportunity to improve the efficiency even more, even though it went down drastically in the year since uh, they received the upgrades. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron, who's going to talk about commercial buildings, unless anyone else has any questions about single or multifamily homes at this time. All right. All right. Thank you, Karen. Um, so while Karen's area of expertise is more in the residential area, um, my experience comes mainly from working with uh, commercial buildings, both new construction and building retrofits. Um, and of course, uh, commercial buildings can be a pretty wide range of different buildings. So I've worked on things like uh, retail store spaces, an indoor water park and lodge, uh, a hospital, uh, a nursing school, a boarding school, all sorts of different buildings um, that all, of course, have very different heating and cooling and energy needs. And, of course, because of that, they all need very different uh, solutions. So commercial buildings have some challenges that make them a little bit different than residential buildings. Um, one is the fact that they tend to be larger buildings in general. And because of this, they tend to have much more complex HVAC systems. So especially if you're trying to think about like, something like a hospital, so they have to have different wings that are separated with completely different air handling systems so you don't have cross-contamination and air from an area with sick patients uh, getting into a different area. You have to have lines for oxygen and nitrogen um, and all of the other um, gases that are used in a hospital. Um, rooms have to be pressurized differently. So in rooms you want a, a negative pressure, meaning air isn't flowing out of that room. If you have a room that you have people with, I don't know, measles or something in it, you don't want that air pushing out of air spaces into the surrounding areas. So balancing those different air pressures um, within the room becomes more complicated and has to have a higher level of precision. And because of that, of course, the HVAC design becomes more complicated as well. So because systems are larger, because they're more complex, uh, there tends to be a higher upfront cost to the owner when you actually have to go out and do a retrofit. So it's not like you're replacing one um, 
small boiler that's heating a home or a two-family home. You're replacing a, a large-scale, several boiler sister system that can be heating water for you know hundreds of people, depending on what type of space it is. Uh, so because of the higher upfront costs, you tend to have a longer payback period for major upgrades, so meaning it's going to take you more time to gain back uh, that investment because you had to invest so much more money up front. Uh, some other challenges with retail space, typically someone will own the building and then they'll rent that space to a particular retailer, whether that be a restaurant, a clothing store, a coffee shop, whatever it is. Uh, and for the most part, um, it's not the owner that pays the energy bills, it's the renter that actually pays the energy bills themselves. So the owner might not have as much of an incentive to retrofit their building, knowing that they would have to pay, pay the cost of the retrofit, whereas it would be their renters, their store owners, would actually be getting the benefits by uh, lower utility bills each month to those individuals, not to the owner themselves. Um, so because there are so many challenges associated with these commercial buildings, um, there are actually a lot of incentives out there, government incentives um, and others, uh, in order to help encourage people to make these upgrades to their large buildings because these buildings do use a large uh, percentage of our energy um, and can be very energy intensive if you don't uh, update the systems that they have. So one of the first things here is a really good resource. Um, this is called the Database of State Incentives for Renewable renewables and efficiency. So it has the unfortunate acronym of DESIRE. It sounds more like a Tinder or a Grindr type site, but I promise you it is not. It's for looking up energy incentives. Um, and this is great not only for commercial buildings, but this, they actually have um, residential, multifamily, uh, other types of incentives as well. Um, so I would definitely recommend checking this out. You can search by your state. You can put in your zip code to find some more local things. So what the images you're seeing here, I put in um, my Troy, New York zip code. And what popped up is a whole bunch of different uh, options that are out there if I was to want to do a um, energy retrofit program. So you can see we have things like a renewable energy uh, tax credit, the New York Sun commercial industrial incentive program, uh, an on-site wind incentive program. So all sorts of different um, rebates, grants, tax break programs related to these types of um, energy savings, either new construction, retrofits, basically anything out there. Loans as well. Um, they have a green initiative loan program. Um, so really, this is a very comprehensive uh, database of all the different uh, incentives for renewables and energy efficiency. So definitely something to check out for commercial buildings or otherwise. So right here, I clicked on one of these incentives that came up when I did my local search. And the one I clicked on was the Commercial Existing Facilities Program. So again, this is related to commercial retrofits, what we're talking about. Um, and you can see that they have sort of two different paths here. One is if you're just going to make small, simple changes, like replacing some equipment. Uh, you can do these installations, and then you can get reimbursed for up to, up to $60,000, which is a pretty substantial um, amount of money. Um, or you can do uh, a different path if you're taking custom improvements, um, if you actually involve the, that's NYSERDA, is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. If you get uh, the Energy Authority involved, or involved early on in your process um, and helping you to determine what sort of changes you're going to make, um, you can get uh, incentives of a much higher amount starting at a minimum of 30000 and going even higher depending on what it is. Uh, that you're actually doing. So there is a lot of money out here uh, for these types of programs. Uh, governments have a big incentive uh, to get people to reduce their energy. You know, it's beneficial to the environment. Um, we, so they have a lot of funding. They have subsidies. And they are more than willing to help um, commercial building owners and individual bu uh, building owners help make these upgrades if it's something that they can't afford to do on their own or if they can't afford to pay their, the upfront costs without something like a loan. Um, so I kind of broke it down into, into two different sets of, of retrofits. One is the mo the first one is kind of like the common commercial mo uh, retrofits, the ones you're more likely to see, sort of what we call the low-hanging fruit. And so these are the low-hanging fruit because they tend to be lower cost, they're easier to do, they don't involve ripping apart your entire building and making large-scale replacements. Um, so some of the main things that you do 
One is putting in a better building management system. So just like Karen was talking about uh, the Nest system or the TACO system, uh, they make commercial scale systems like this that are look a lot more complicated, obviously, because like I mentioned, you have a lot more going on uh, in your building system. Uh, so the one on the right is sort of a screen printout of what you might see on building uh, monitoring software. So it actually gives you a time look at what's running, what fans are running, how many air changes per hour you have, how fast your air is moving, what chillers are operating and what are turned off. Um, and someone within the plant, like a, this was a hospital, um, someone within the hospital could be monitoring this. And then you could also have an uh, energy management firm or an engineering firm uh, off-site that also had access to this. So they could actually check in and see what happened and see that if you know a certain air handler broke for some reason, they could switch the system over to running a different one, or they could figure out a way um, to sort of operate around this. Um, so this is a really good tool that more and more commercial buildings are using. One, because it allows them just to keep track of what's going on. They can see their energy use in real time. Uh, they can monitor their equipment and make sure it's still operating. Um, and two, because it allows them that type of control where they can turn something off. If it's an office building, they can, and they see that you know lights have been left on overnight or that the heat is still set at the regular heating temperature, um, someone can go in without going into the office and, and change those settings, turn off those lights, or turn that heat down to a nighttime temperature. Uh, another major one is lighting upgrades. Um, so it was mentioned, Luke's still on the first slide, thanks. Um, so it was mentioned last week that in commercial buildings, lighting, lighting uh, makes up around 20% of a building's energy use. Uh, so one of the ways that people act to reduce this use is to switch over their lighting fixtures. Again, pretty low-hanging fruit. For the most part, you don't have to tear walls or ceilings apart uh, to get to your lighting fixtures. Uh, and people are making upgrades to complex fluorescents, CFLs, or now more commonly LEDs. Um, we're now at the point where LED lighting um, is affordable, is compatible with CFLs, not quite as cheap yet, um, but getting much closer. And we have some really good systems in place and really good bulbs and products. So when LEDs first came out and they first hit the market, uh, there was the problem that there was a ton of different companies trying to get involved in the LED market. Some were making great products, some were not. Some were going out of business in only a couple of years. So one client was explaining to me that they had redone, it was a um, restaurant building, and they had redone their ceiling with LED lights with you know specific components made from one manufacturers. Something happened and one piece of the system broke and they went back to get it. And that company was completely out of business. And none of the other companies produced anything um, that, was, that was similar or worked with that same system. So they ended up having to put a new system in one portion of their building that produced a slightly different quality of light, and it just didn't look the same. And so that was at the stage where LEDs really weren't there, really weren't ready yet. But now at this point, we have GE and Philips and some of those big uh, lighting experts uh, making really good products. And so now LEDs are the, the, the way that most buildings are going when they do a, a lighting retrofit. So another more basic um, solution, just like you can replace a boiler in a multifamily unit, you can also replace um, a boiler or a part of your HVAC system uh, in an office building. And the same goes for office equipment. So within an office, equipment actually contributes to a big portion of your energy use. So if you have hundreds of computers, printers, um, Xerox machines, whatever it is you have, uh, we now are making much more efficient office equipment that has things like power saving modes and um, nighttime shutdown and just generally uses uh, less electricity. So switching over the equipment within your office is another easy way uh, to reduce your energy use. Um, and finally, adding insulation, similar to the way Karen talked about it, either blown in insulation or whatever way um, it is that you do it, exterior insulation. Uh, is slightly more um, intensive, can slightly more uh, involve getting more into the, the structure of the building. Um, but still nothing major, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, and adding shading, this can be as, as easy as literally adding shades to the building or um, using different window glazing, using exterior shading and overhang to protect the, the windows um, from sunlight during certain times of the day. So the alternatives is sort of the, uh, the low-hanging fruit, the common commercial retrofits. There are also some more intensive, uh, less common commercial retrofits. These are also sometimes called deep retrofits. 
Um, these are some things that you won't see as frequently, but they have bigger energy savings. Um, in part, you won't see them as frequently uh, because they're much more expensive to do. Uh, they're much more complicated. They're more easily done in a new construction uh, situation than done as a retrofit or attached onto a building later. Um, so on the left here, you see a green roof. You've all probably heard about green roofs now. Um, you know, we use plants on the roof to help provide insulation and shading to keep the building from getting too hot. At the same time, they reduce storm water runoff, runoff because they actually absorb the water. Green roofs are something that we like to think is like a brand new invention that we came up with in the U.S. just a couple years ago. Uh, but we're actually going to talk about in week five when we talk about learning some alternative building techniques from traditional societies that in some places they've been putting sod and grass on top of their roofs for thousands of years with the realization that it can help keep their buildings uh, cool in the summer and insulated uh, in the winter. So the thing you see on the right is what's called a cool roof. So roofing is one example where you can do a, a somewhat more simple retrofit simply by adding lighter color reflective shingles. So they actually make Energy Star rated shingles. Um, if you replace the roof with these types of shingles alone, that will provide you some amount of energy sa saving because you're reflecting uh, more sunlight away from the roof. Um, but you can also do something slightly more complicated. Uh, the roof you see here, the cool roof style, um, not only has a reflective surface, but it creates an airspace in between the interior roof membrane and the outer surface that sort of acts as an insulating layer. So the hot air sort of flows up through the roof and then exits the building at the top, keeping the cool air trapped on the inside. Um, and in the winter, in the colder months, um, it retains warmth that keeps the, the heat trapped inside, again, by providing this sort of insulating layer. So any sort of roof change, though, is more of a deep retrofit because you're not really going to go and pull up a, a perfectly good roof on a building. You really t only have to replace the roof on a building around every 20 years. So it's not something you're going to do unless your existing roof really has some, some problems to begin with or some leaks to begin with. So the other one you see here in the bottom right is what's called an underfloor air distribution system. So unlike heating, or unlike um, residential buildings in Chicago where heating's your biggest cost, for the most part in commercial buildings, cooling is your major cost. So you have a lot of people in a small space. You have a lot of office equipment in a small space. Those are actually making a big contribution to the building heat load and heating up the buildings by themselves. So for the most part, office buildings are very rarely heated. Um, even in cooler climates, um, it's mainly air conditioning that, that's working. Of course, there is some heating in the winter, but air conditioning makes up a much larger cost and a much larger portion of buildings' energy use. Uh, so the traditional way of heating a building is that you sort of have an overhead space or a plenum space, and you're pushing the hot or cool air whatever you know, treated air you have down from above into the workspace, and then it's leaving on the bottom. And as we know, hot air rises, so that's not very efficient if you're heating. You're essentially pushing out hot air. It might never be getting down to the ground level where people are sitting. Um, so this underfloor air distribution system actually runs the air underneath the floor and sends the cool air up from underneath. So it passes up through the office building, it passes by the people and the equipment, and sort of picks up the heat generated by those people along the way, and then uses natural convection and the fact that hot air rises to bring that hot air up to the top and out of the building. So I just have one example on the next slide of a, a deep retrofit of a commercial building. Um, so this is sort of like a, a case study example. So this is the Alliance uh, Center, the Alliance for Sustainability in Colorado. This is their, their headquarters. And this is important to see because this is a 100-year-old warehouse that they purchased in the historic downtown area. Uh, it's common to think that you see energy savings more in brand new buildings, new constructions, but you can do a significant amount of retrofitting to even a really old building uh, and make it more energy efficient. Um, so they wanted this to be, um, this is a, a multi-tenant, non-profit center. They wanted it to be a healthy, efficient, mission-enhancing work, workspace as they describe here. Um, and so they wanted to do things that will promote building health, energy and water efficiency, but also keep the, the uh, traditional features and the historic features of the building. Um, so what they did here, you can see on the right, they list these key measures. Uh, they replaced the old pneumatic controls with a direct digital control system, so like one of those building management systems we talked about. 
They added occupancy sensors and photo cells to control lighting. So not only would they turn the lights off when someone was in the room, they would turn the light off if they were at a time where lots of daylight was coming in the room. Um, I already sort of mentioned the building management system. Uh, they installed high efficiency glazing, so this means high efficiency windows. Uh, they replaced the T12 lamps, which is one type of compact fluorescent lights, with T8, a more energy efficient type of lamps that had uh, dimmable ballast. They increased the insulation in the building's exterior. And on the top floor, they in installed uh, sunshades, so overhangs that would protect uh, the windows from getting sunlight in them during the hottest time of the day. Um, so what you can see here is on the, this little blue and white graph, they have their total project costs were about 168000 But I mentioned there's lots of incentives out there. So they got around 25000 in energy efficiency financial incentives as well as 26,000 other incentives. I'm not quite sure what those are. Um, but that brought the cost down significantly. Again, it's still pretty high. It's still over a $100,000 project, but they took it down from 168,000 to 117,000 by taking advantage of some of those uh, opportunities. So it's estimated that with all of these updates installed, they saved $8,000 a year on heating and that their, their payback period, so they'll make that money back, that 168000 that they invested, within 13.3 years. And this is still kind of a long time, but not if you think about that the lifetime of this particular building, a lifetime of a building is a very long time. So 13.3 years might sound like a long time, but this building is still going to be here in another 100 years. All right, so... I'm going to so... switch it back over to Karen. Yep, so we have about eight minutes left, and we wanted to open up the floor a little bit to you all and see what kind of examples of energy efficiency you've thought about in your own life. Um, this was part of our assignment from last week. So you're thinking about um, where your home or your classrooms or your office building wastes energy and what you think could be done to improve the efficiency of each of these energy wasting areas. Um, so, do we have any volunteers from the audience? You can raise your hand. Not, I'm just going to call on someone. All right, um, Lainey, do you want to talk about that? Uh, sure. Okay, am I off that? Yep. Um, so, the... <laughs> The building that I talked about was actually my dorm, uh, my campus dorm. And one of the things I noticed that was pretty interesting, or interesting and pretty bad, is that the stairwell in the winter is actually the, the hottest place in the dorm, which I know is really bad because stairwells are supposed to be unconditioned, um, mm -hmm. at least in terms of heat and stuff like that, because it's not people are spending a lot of time in there. Uh, so that's definitely something that I was talking about um, that could be redressed and should be addressed. Cool. Um, yeah, other than that, it's just in general, the, I feel like it's true for a lot of dorms too. Um, just pretty outdated. Um, you get a better, like, more efficient uh, technology. So, uh, and sinks, uh, so for like water conservation, and <laughs> better sealing, uh, like better windows with a better seal to them. Uh, a lot of them don't close all the way, so that lets in a ton of air as well, colder. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, especially the stairwell thing, that always drives me nuts. Um, and. The, the air sealing is always an important thing, not only to save energy, but to improve the comfort of people living in those spaces. Uh -huh. All right. Um, does anyone else want to share an example of a way they can improve uh, energy efficiency where they live or where they work or study? Take um, one or two more examples, and then we'll, clo we'll close up for today. Um, Gabriel, how about you? Oh no. Um, <laughs> well, I'm actually sitting right next to Lainey, so that's <laughs> interesting. Um, so I think an underrated uh, element that um, 
I believe you mentioned actually. Some overhangs for uh, <clears throat> because we live in upstate New York and it's really hot and humid and then it gets really cold and sad. <laughs> and those overhangs um, for, for in the winter time when the sun's low, we could get direct solar gain through through windows and such. Um, also, most of the buildings are awfully positioned. Um, I was like just realizing that when I was sitting here, where uh, the orientation is such that the wind is hitting the broad side of it. So that convection is just like destroying our heating costs and it's a long building, but the short side is facing south, so that doesn't help either. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, so. Before we head out for today, I just wanted to close out by talking about my life as an energy analyst or an energy auditor in the city of Chicago um, to just kind of get you, give you a sense of like what the job is like, what I'm looking for, what I'm dealing with on a daily basis, and how I got here. So um, first of all, um, being an energy analyst requires certification. Um, so I'm certified with the Building Performance Institute, BPI, to do as an energy analyst and as an envelope professional. So that means that I can do audits, um, especially, and I can do the tests that we talked about, as well as a few others that I didn't have time to share. And the envelope professional means that I can recommend specific air sealing and insulation measures. Um, so I know a lot about the insulation materials and what's best for specific buildings and applications. Um, so the audits that I do, I'm usually doing one or two per week um, site visits, and these are mostly for low-income apartment buildings in Chicago and the suburbs, as well as the rest of Illinois. So these are typically take two to three hours to complete. Um, we're spending a lot of time looking at the central heating equipment, especially the boiler, um, testing the efficiency, looking for any health and safety problems, and also looking at lighting. Um, water fixtures and anything like that. Um, and then the so that's actually kind of the least the least amount of time on the job. A lot of the time is spent navigating the complex waters of rebates and grants and everything. So I put a bunch of logos of a whole bunch of, a whole slew of different entities that I'm dealing with. Um, so a lot of these are the um, utilities in the state of Illinois, like NICOR, ComEd, People's Gas, Amarin, Illinois. Um, some of them are, this, are governments, so the city of Chicago, um, the Illinois Department of Commerce, and some of them are um, lending corporations, like the Community Investment Corporation. So I'm trying to figure out, like Aaron was talking about, um, what utility rebates are available, what kind of grants billing owners have, and how to leverage all of those to do the best thing for the building. Um, got a question, are you LEED certified, or is that something you'd be interested in getting? Um, so I'm not LEED certified. Um, it's something I would be interested in, um, but that's Right now, a lot of my focus is on existing buildings and improving the conditions there, and that's not something LEED focuses on as much. A lot more, they're a lot more focused on new construction. So LEED certification is also a lot more uh, commercial focused. So if you ended up working in the commercial industry, you'd likely have to get LEED certified to do that, yeah. or your company at least would want you to be LEED certified to do that. Yeah. My company actually does have a few lead certified analysts, but they're focused, like Aaron said, more on the commercial side. Um, so that's it for today. Um, does anyone else have any questions about um, energy efficiency, uh, the process, what it's like, any other questions about specific 
things you can do to buildings, we're happy to answer them. And otherwise, thanks for joining this week. I would also add if this is something you're interested in, um, most engineering programs have HVAC design courses. Uh, there's also a lot of computer programs out there for doing building energy modeling. Uh, to be honest, it's been a while since I've been in it, so I don't know what the current programs are um, that are most commonly used today. Um, but uh, DOE, Department of Energy, creates that type of software, um, and that might be something you would want to look into learning that you'd eventually have to learn. Great. All right, so um, next week, same time, same place, and we're going to be focusing on energy modeling and whole building design. Um, there's an assignment which you can see on the course syllabus, although this may be outdated. Um, so Rob, will, Rob or Andrew or I or Aaron will send around um, an email with information on what that assignment is. So unless there are any questions, I think that's it for today, and thank you for joining us.